Let's go ahead and open our Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 8. 1 Kings chapter 8. Amen. We'll back up a little bit tonight and uh, read a few verses in chapter 7 as well. This is one of those sermons that I, I, I say a lot of things to make a simple point. And so I, I, I hope that the Lord will help me remember all the things I'm going to say and say them clearly. But uh, hopefully when we leave this place, we will leave here understanding the one point. That's my goal. Amen. Amen. So let's not get caught up in all the peripheral things, but uh, hopefully that'll be the case. So let's get to stand together. We're going to read responsibly tonight, if you don't mind doing that. And uh, we'll pick it up in chapter 7 of First Kings. And of course, we have been going through the life of Solomon on uh, Sunday evenings, and I've really enjoyed it. Uh, I have. And we've gotten to this place here where Solomon's just finishing up this temple. So notice we read in verse 51. And we'll read again, uh, responsibly, down to verse 11 of chapter 8. We read, So was ended all the work that King Solomon made for the house of the Lord. And Solomon brought in the things which David his father had dedicated, even the silver and the gold and the vessels did he put among the treasures of the house of the Lord. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the chief of the fathers of the children of Israel, unto King Solomon in Jerusalem, that they might bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. And all the men of Israel assembled themselves unto King Solomon at the feast in the month Ethanim, which is the seventh month. And all the elders of Israel came, and the priests took up the Ark. And they brought up the ark of the Lord and the tabernacle of the congregation and all the holy vessels that were in the tabernacle, even those did the priests and the Levites bring up. And King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel that were assembled unto him were with him before the ark, sacrificing sheep and oxen that could not be told nor numbered for multitude. And the priest brought in the ark of the covenant of the Lord unto his place into the oracle of the house to the most holy place, even under the wings of the cherubims. For the cherubims spread forth their two wings over the place of the ark, and the cherubims covered the ark and the staves thereof above. And they drew out the staves, that the ends of the staves were seen out in the holy place before the oracle, and they were not seen without, and there they are unto this day. There was nothing in the ark save the two tables of stone, which Moses put there at Horeb, when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. It came to pass, when the priests were come out of the holy place, that the cloud filled the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. Must have been an amazing time. Would love to have been there. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you again for the opportunity to open up your word. Thank you for the freedoms that we enjoy in America. And Lord, I pray this evening that you'd please rebuke and bind the devil. And Lord, that your word tonight would have free course. Please help me as I preach the message that you've led me to preach. We recognize all of us that without you, we can do nothing. Amen. Lord, I need thee to preach. We need thee to hear. Please do a work in our hearts that only you can do this evening. May we be attentive tonight to your word, and we commit this message to thee. Ask you to use it for your glory. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. First Kings chapters 5, 6, and 7, Solomon was leading the children of Israel with the help of others, of course Hiram, the king of Tyre, had a part in it, to uh, build the temple, of course the temple in Jerusalem. Now we talked about this a little bit last week, and 
Remember, the constructing of the temple was the greatest building project in Solomon's reign as king. Amen. It was a big thing that he did. And there's uh, several things as means of introduction I'd like to note about the temple. Three things. Number one is this. The temple was one of the most magnificent and expensive buildings ever built. Amen. Now, it's gone today. We understand that. But it was. One of the commentators had said that in today's money, the temple cost billions of dollars. Amen. Even in the early 1900s, uh, Pelubet's Bible Dictionary estimated the cost of the temple in the early 1900s as 2.5 at 2.5 billion dollars. Man, that was expensive. I mean, the materials alone for the temple were incredible. Uh, 100 talents of gold, according to First Chronicles 22, a thousand talents of silver. Brass and iron that could not be numbered. I mean, so much, you couldn't even count it. Imagine that. Beautiful, precious stones. There were onyx stones that they used. Uh, glistening stones, they called them, of diverse colors. Uh, precious stones, they called them. Marble, and they said, in abundance. It was an incredible, incredible building. Listen to some of the adjectives used to describe this building. It was called great. It was called beautiful. It was called exceeding magnificent. It was called a, a building of fame and glory throughout all countries. Amen. Imagine that. Imagine walking there in Jerusalem and seeing on that Temple Mount this absolutely beautiful place and what it looked like. I like what John Butler wrote about this. He said, of course, there are some today who would protest and say that the money should have been used to be given to the poor, like Judas Iscariot said. He said, but that old argument is one that greatly dishonors God. Most of the poor in our land are that way because they are lazy, drunkards, or immoral. That we should subsidize them at the cost of cheapening our places of worship is absolutely scandalous. Right. He goes on to say, if you're going to build a place of worship, make it of such character that it honors God. Amen. I like what he says here. He says, no one talks about helping the poor when huge sports stadiums are built. Right. But anyway, let's move on. Uh, God's people gave, we know, with a willing heart uh, to pay for this building. That's how God subsidized it. Uh, the leaders of the nation even gave to the temple. David the king, out of his own resources, gave for this wonderful, wonderful building. Thousands and th upon thousands of skilled people uh, helped in building this as well. Uh, again, it was a magnificent place. Then a second thing I'd like for us to note is that man did not design the temple. Amen. God did. That's interesting, isn't it? One Solomon at one day, was or actually David, was scratching his head and said, you know, let's come up with this great place, this great temple. Now Solomon did not dream up the design. He did not hire an architect. The design of the temple came from God Almighty uh, through Solomon's father, David. Amen. We read in 2 Chronicles 28, 11, then David gave to Solomon his son the pattern of the porch and of the houses thereof and of the treasuries thereof and of the upper chambers thereof and of the inner parlors thereof and of the place of the mercy seat and the pattern of all that he had by the spirit of the, uh, of the courts of the house of the Lord and all the chambers round about the treasuries of the house of God. All this said David, the Lord made me understand in right by his hand upon me even all the works of this pattern. So David said this. This is what God wanted. Amen. This is the way that God wants it designed. Amen. So this temple was not man's design. It was God's design. Amen. And then thirdly, I'd like for us to note uh, that the construction of the temple, even with all those people, thousands of people, the leaders in Israel, the skilled people, uh, the people of Tyre, uh, Hiram, and so forth, uh, took seven and a half years to build. 
We read in 1 Kings chapter 6 in verse 1, uh, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign, it began and it was finished in the 11th year of Solomon's reign. So again, this, this building took uh, uh, seven and a half years, uh, tens of thousands of man hours, uh, and an enormous amount of money to complete. And now, as we just read a moment ago in our text, uh, the temple is complete. Look at verse 51. So was ended all the work that King Solomon made for the house of the Lord. Here it is, finished, done. Amen. Not quite. Almost. There's one little thing, big thing I should say, that has to be done. What is that? There is one final piece that needs to be brought into the temple to make it complete. And may I say that it is the most important piece in the temple. It is the most significant piece of the temple. And without this one piece being in its rightful place, the temple would be unfinished, it would be incomplete, it would be even, mark the word, purposeless. Because the entire temple, this entire structure, was designed and built for this one piece. Amen. What piece am I speaking of? Well, I, we just read it. Praise the Lord. Ark of the Covenant. Amen. You see, Solomon knew that the entire worship system that God prescribed for the Old Testament nation of Israel was centered around this one piece piece. Uh, every other piece pointed to that piece. It was the most sacred piece that existed. Uh, and here in our text, King Solomon is bringing up the Ark of the Covenant and he's putting it in its proper place. Notice verse 1. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the chief of the fathers of the children of Israel, unto King Solomon in Jerusalem, watch this, that they might bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. You see, to Solomon, he understood that the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant was of utmost priority. Amen. And understand something. Solomon did not bring the Ark of the Covenant in last because it was the least important. He brought it in last because it was the most important. Amen. Why so? We're going to find out tonight. Tonight I want to preach on this subject, the prioritizing of a king. The prioritizing of a king. Tonight I'd like for us to see why this piece, this Ark of the Covenant, was so important to Solomon and how that relates to me and you today. Hopefully we'll get there. Now don't be scared. My first point is probably the longest. We'll spend some time there. And so the second two are a little less. So I won't have you here till midnight. We got food downstairs. Amen. But we'll get there. Let's consider number one, the place of the Ark of the Covenant. Is this okay tonight? Do I just, I just, we'll just can this thing. I'll just stay behind the pulpit. The place of the Ark of the Covenant. What I mean by that, let, let's think, what place did the Ark of the Covenant have in the life of the Jew? Well, can I start off by saying this, uh, that it, was, it had a prominent place in the life of the Jew. Why so? Well, go back to Exodus chapter 25. Exodus 25. Can I give this to you? Because I think I want to walk around in a minute here. And uh, would you mind giving that to them? And I might need that. If not, we'll just do what we got to do. Exodus 25, would you go back there? Back in Exodus 25, if you remember, the nation or the children of Israel were redeemed from Egyptian bondage. Amen. Back in Exodus chapter 12. In Exodus chapter 14, I, I'm, it's my habit, just walking away. So just, just listen, I'll try to keep my voice up. In Exodus chapter 14, we read of them passing through the Red Sea. They marched down from the Red Sea right down and, and camp at the foot of Mount Sinai. They reached the foot of Mount Sinai. 
Sinai in Exodus chapter 19. And they are at the foot of Mount Sinai from Exodus chapter 19 all the way to Numbers chapter 10. That whole time, uh, uh, Exodus, Leviticus to Numbers 10, they are there at the foot of Mount Sinai. They were there for one year, two months, and 20 days before they moved forward. It was during that time that God gave to Moses the Ten Commandments uh, and the instructions and also the instructions for the tabernacle. God told Moses that he wanted the nation of Israel, the children of Israel, to build him a tabernacle. Notice Exodus chapter 25 in verses 8 and 9. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. And for the next 15 chapters, from Exodus 25 all the way to Exodus chapter 40, God gave them some very specific instructions on what God wanted them to build and how God wanted them to build it. Now, there were basically three sections to the Old Testament tabernacle. Excuse me. The first section was what is called the outer court. We read that in, uh, look at Exodus chapter 27 and verses 9 through 19. Just glance there, if you will, in verse 9. And thou shalt make the court of the tabernacle. For the south side southward there shall be hangings for the court of fine twine linen of a hundred cubits long for one side. We'll stop there for time's sake. But I want you to imagine the tabernacle for a moment. I'll speak loud if you don't mind. Uh, as having three sections. The first one would be the outer court. Now the outer court, imagine this room in your mind and double the size because the outer court was about twice the size uh, of this room. Uh, it was 75 feet wide. This room's probably about 35 or so. It was 150 feet long, and so it was a rectangle. It would have a door as you walked into the, tab the outer court, and it would be surrounded kind of like what I would call a, a, a fence, a linen curtain fence made of fine twine linen. And so no one from the outside could see inside this court. And so again, the first portion of it is this outer court. You'd walk into this outer court, uh, this courtyard, and you would see inside this courtyard the tabernacle itself. Now, the tabernacle itself consisted of two areas, I'll call it two rooms, if you will, of which there is a graduated scale of holiness. You'll see what I mean here in a moment. The very first room that you'd come to was called the holy place, also called the inner court. It was kind of an enclosed room, not like the outer court, which just had kind of a seven and a half foot fence of linen curtain. This room was totally enclosed. It was 15 feet wide, which would be about the size of this center row, if you will, and 30 feet long. That would be the holy place. After you enter into the holy place, there's a veil that goes into another room, another enclosed room. So you have the outer court, then you have the inner court or the holy place. Then you have this second room, which was called the most holy place Amen. or the holy of holies. Amen. This again was an enclosed room. This one though, instead of being a like rectangular shape like the outer court and the holy place, this one was a perfect square. It was 15 feet wide by 15 feet long. Of course, 10 cubits by 10 cubits. And this second room was separated, as I said, from the holy place by a very thick veil or a very thick curtain about the thickness of a person's hand. Now Moses also instructed from Exodus chapter 25 to Exodus chapter 40, he instructed the Jews to make certain pieces of furniture and instruments for the tabernacle. For the outer court, let me grab this here if you don't mind. For the outer court, if you remember, I mentioned that place that uh, had like that fence around it. Uh, there were two items. We're going to try this here. Man. 
Say amen if this goes on. I want to throw that out, amen? <laughs> Come back to where we were at. Where were we? Where were we? We're in the outer court. So here we are in the outer court. Again, it's about twice the size of this room. As you walk in, there are two items that are in that outer court before you get to the holy place. The very first thing that you walk to when you get into that gate that you'd find is the brazen altar. On that brazen altar would be the place where the sacrifice... We're going to try this again. Amen. I'm excited about it. Uh, on that brazen altar... Hey, Amen. And all God's people said, amen. Listen, it's, it's probably the operator, I guarantee you. It's me. But we got it, amen. I'm just pu punching buttons. Okay, so you walk into this outer court. You have the brazen altar. You go beyond the outer court, and there is what's called the laver. Uh, that was what, I, I don't know, I kind of, <laughs> it's going to make it sound funny. It's how I think. It was like a bird bath, you know, a big old bird bath, right? Uh, so you'd have the brazen altar, then you'd have this laver where the priest would wash, and then you would enter into the holy place. So God told him, make the brazen altar, make the laver, and put it there in the outer court. In the holy place, there are three items as well. On the right side, as you walk in, you'd see the table of shoe bread. On the left side, you'd see the golden candlestick. And then in front of you, you'd find the altar of incense, kind of right before the veil. And then you'd go into the most holy place, or the holy of holies, and in that place, though, would be only one item. Again, this would be the most important piece in the tabernacle, and that would be the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the Ark of the Covenant was a piece that God commanded them to make uh, that resembled, I would say, again, I'm just using the way I think, it would be kind of like this right here, uh, this communion table. That's about uh, the size of it. It was kind of like, if you will, a, a, cedar, uh, a, a cedar chest. Now, look at, go back to Exodus chapter 25 and look at verse, uh, verse 10. Notice we read, and they shall make an ark of shittim wood. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, within and without shalt thou overlay it, and shall make up... Uh, Make upon it a crown of gold round about, and thou shalt cast four rings of gold for it, and, and put them in the four corners thereof, and two rings shall be on the one side of it, and two rings in the other side of it, and thou shalt make staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with gold, and thou shalt put the staves into the rings by the sides of the ark, that the ark may be borne with them. The staves shall be in the rings of the ark, they shall not be taken from it, and thou shalt put in into the ark the testimony well, which I shall give thee. And so imagine, I'm going to stop there, imagine this ark of the covenant like uh, this communion table. It was a one and a half cubits high, uh, a one and a half cubits wide, and two and a half cubits long. In other words, it was kind of four feet long, which is about what that is, by two feet wide and two feet high. Now it was made of this wood called shittim wood, acacia wood, some call it that. And on top of this, this lid, and by the way, the whole thing was overlaid in gold. And on top of it, the lid or the top of it was made of solid gold. And placed on top of that was something called the mercy seat. And the mercy seat. More about that here in a moment. On each side of, uh, on each end of the uh, uh, the mercy seat, if you were to imagine the the mercy seat kind of being right here in the center. On this side of it, on this side, there were two huge cherubims uh, that sp that spread out their wings uh, over the mercy seat. Their their wings actually touched uh, right in the center, uh, almost as if to protect the glory of God from man. Uh, also. Also on the side of the tabernacle or the uh, ark were rings to carry it, carry it around in, and, and so forth. Uh, inside the ark were the Ten Commandments on the stones that, that God wrote with his own finger. So think about that. Here is this piece, beautiful, absolutely beautiful, gold covered, rings on the side, staves that went through it to carry this piece around, and on top the mercy seat. Inside of that, that Ark of the Covenant was 
the broken law, the Ten Commandments. Amen. Also inside the ark at different times, later here in the days of Solomon, it'll be gone. But they placed Aaron's budded rod, and they placed the golden pot of manna. But what made the ark so important was something I want to show you here, if you're in Exodus chapter 25, is what God said about it. Uh, notice, if you would, in verse uh, 20. And the cherubims shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces shall look one to another. Toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be, and thou shalt put the mercy seat above the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony, that's the Ten Commandments, that I shall give thee. Notice verse 22. And there, Amen. I'll say it again, and there... I will meet with thee, Amen. and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. Uh, so notice God said, this uh, ark uh, is the place where I will meet with you. Now, every single year on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would enter into that uh, outer court. He would make the sacrifice on the brazen altar. He would do the washings, if you will, at the laver. Uh, he'd go into the holy place. But only one time in the year on the Day of Atonement would he march through that veil. He would take the blood of the sacrifice uh, from the brazen altar, and he would sprinkle that blood on that mercy seat, uh, and when he did that, what would happen was the Shekinah glory of God would appear to him there and they would meet with God right there at the Ark of the Covenant. So my point is this. I said all that to say this. The Ark of the Covenant was a very, very significant place because it represented the very presence of of God. It was a place that God met with them. Now that's why for centuries the Jews uh, meticulously cared for and guarded for uh, the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, everywhere they went, the Ark of the Covenant went with them. Uh, when they were brought from place to place in the wilderness, what did they do? The Ark of the Covenant went with them. When the, uh, uh, the pillar of cloud, a uh, uh, pillar of fire and the cloud stopped and told them to encamp, <coughs> excuse me, they would place the Ark of the Covenant in the center of the camp and the, ca uh, the tribes would camp around that Ark of the Covenant making that the centerpiece uh, of, of their society, if you will. Uh, when they came into the land, uh, they took the Ark of the Covenant. Remember when they crossed the Jordan River, right? Went to the Jordan River. The priests stood there with their feet and the water stopped. They stood there with the Ark as the people passed through. When they got into the land, they set it up in Shiloh. And there the tabernacle was once they got settled. Uh, the Ark of the Covenant was captured by the Philistines in 1 Samuel chapter 4. It was then returned to them by the Philistines because it was a curse uh, uh, to them. Uh, and then it was kept in the house of Abinadab in a place called Gibeah near Jerusalem according to 1 Samuel chapter 7. Then when David became king, of course the Ark was there, he took the Ark and he moved it to Jerusalem. He moved it to the city of David. He built his own palace and he set the ark there in the city of David and he built a little tent for that, making sure that it was there in the nation's presence. You see, now here Solomon is king and when he becomes king and he finishes the temple, he knows that it's absolutely imperative, it's vital that this piece is where it should should be. You know what's interesting is that most of the items uh, of furniture for the tabernacle were replaced. I kind of read through that because I wasn't sure uh, if that was right, but, but it was. David replaced them, but there was one thing that wasn't replaced that was the original. You know what it was? The Ark of the Covenant. 
uh, the Ark of the Covenant. It was original for, uh, from the days of Moses. So again, I say Solomon knew that the most important thing about this grand, magnificent, exceeding magnificent temple that he was building was not how nice it looked, was not how big it was, was not how many people were involved, was not how much money they spent on it. The most, what made the temple significant was the presence of God. Amen. You see, if God wasn't present, right. then the temple would just be another building. Amen. So I said all that to say this. Do you know the most important thing in our lives as Christians, in our homes, as believers, in our marriages, and in our church, is one thing, Amen. and one thing alone. Praise the, Lord. the presence of God. That's what we need. Amen. We need him. Amen. You see, what makes a home a Christian home is not merely that the people in that home are saved. A lot of times people think that. Well, we're all saved, so we have a Christian home. That doesn't make a Christian home. It's, it's the start of a Christian home. What makes a home a Christian home is the presence of Jesus Christ Praise in that home. Amen. What makes a church a church uh, that God can use, that God will bless, uh, uh, that God will use to see souls saved and lives changed is not the size of the buildings. It's not the beauty of the buildings. It's not the size of the crowd that we can get inside this place. It is the presence of Christ in that church uh, that makes a difference. What's going to make your marriage Christ-honoring is not the signs that you hang on your wall in your bedroom, we love God, or the amount of Bibles that are laying around your house. It is the presence of Christ in each of those spouses' life. You see, what makes a Christian the kind of Christian God wants us to be? Again, one thing and one thing alone, and that is the presence of Jesus Amen. Christ. The you see, Solomon understood that what he and his nation needed the most was God Amen. and God's presence Amen. and meeting with God on a regular basis. I wish we could send that message to our, our government leaders. Yeah. I wish we could send that message to every person that's in our church and realize that's what we need more Amen. than anything else. That was the purpose of the ark was it represented the presence of God. So we see, number one, the purpose of the Ark of the Covenant. Then we see, number two, the picture of the Ark of the Covenant. You say, preacher, that was good. That was pretty cool a little bit, what you said about, you know, the room and the size and, the, and, you know, the outer court, the inner court and the holy place and all that and so forth. But we don't have a tabernacle. We don't have a temple. We don't have an ark. Praise the Lord. Guess what? Mm -hmm. We do. Amen. We actually do. You see, for the New Testament Christian, I understand there's a picture here, and uh, uh, we will go to the book of Hebrews here in a little bit, but uh, we do not actually have uh, the Ark of the Covenant today. Uh, the truth of the matter is we don't need it because we have something, or should I say it this way, someone the Lord. that's better. Amen. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, understand that Ark of the Covenant, what it pictured, don't miss it. Apply it to today. That Ark is a picture of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is our Ark of the Covenant. That's who he is. Think about the picture here. Inside that Ark was the law. The law that we broke. The law that we're guilty of defying Amen. and denying. And it was only when the high priest came into that holy place and sprinkled the blood uh, on the mercy seat that God could manifest or would manifest himself to man. God can only look upon sinful man through the blood. Amen. Sound familiar? 
It's only through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, that you and I can commune with God, that you and I can have fellowship with God, that you and I can enter into the presence of God. And the beauty of it today, the beauty of it is, uh, in New Testament times, is we don't have to be a Jew. We don't have to be in the lineage of Aaron. We don't have to be the high priest. We don't have to wait until the day of atonement. We don't even have have to offer an animal sacrifice. Uh, if you are saved here tonight, uh, you and I have access to him anytime, anywhere. He's there for us. You remember when Jesus Christ died on the cross, what happened to that veil of the temple? It rent from top to bottom. Why is that? That was telling us that the way to God is now open for every believer who trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ. And understand, that means something for me and you today. Think about the privilege we have. Think about the opportunity we have. Think about the availability we have. You and I can come boldly to the throne of grace and enter into the very presence of God any time we want to. Go over to Hebrews chapter 4. I kind of mentioned that we were going to go there. Hebrews chapter 4. Notice verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, Amen. let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Amen. Let us therefore, therefore, therefore what? Seeing we have a high priest. Right. Seeing that we don't have to wait for the lineage of Aaron or someone who's of that category, if you will, uh, uh, to do something so we can be in the presence of God. Uh, no, we have the high priest. Jesus Christ is our high priest. And he took care of that on the cross of Calvary. And so understand, uh, notice, let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace uh, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Folks, we understand tonight, I think we do, that we have access to God through Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. We can come to Him anytime, Amen. anywhere, no matter what time of day it is, we can come. That ark was a picture of Jesus Christ, which leads me to the final point, and that is this. Not only the place of the ark of the covenant, and the picture of the ark of the covenant, but notice the priority of the Ark of the Covenant. Can you imagine what that day was like? Amen. When everything was in place for seven and a half years, people were molding things and carving things and pouring out gold and overlaying all of these things. Everything, everything was in place. And here we read, then Solomon, notice how important it was, assemble the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the chief of the fathers of the children of Israel unto King Solomon in Jerusalem, that they might bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord. Notice, out of the city of David, which is Zion. Now, if you go to Jerus Israel and Jerusalem there, and you stand over on the Mount of Olives, you've probably seen this picture uh, dozens of times, as you see the Temple Mount, and you see the wall uh, there to the city, and the, and the eastern gate, which is, uh, which is sealed, uh, uh, sealed up, the Jesus Christ is going to come through. Well, if you look there and you see the Temple Mount, if you were to look to the left, you'd see the, uh, the hill kind of going down there. Uh, to the left there, uh, again, we're on the east side of the city. Uh, to the left there is what's called the City of David. That's where David, David landed, if you will. There is a spring there, and he set up his city there. And when Solomon uh, uh, was uh, going to build the temple, it was up a little bit higher up here. And so so when David had his palace here and the tent there, it was down there in the city of David. Now everything's in place. They're going to bring that thing up and they're going to place it there right where it ought to be. And verse 2, And all the men of Israel assembled themselves unto King Solomon at the feast in the month Ethanip, which is in the seventh month. And so we see this big, big deal. Why is that? Because Solomon knew something. 
He understood something that I'm trying to get across to us tonight. Maybe not so good, but I'm trying. And that is this, the importance of the presence of God. Amen. The importance of meeting with God. He knew they could have this beautiful building that everybody could ooh and ah at, but that was all in vain. That was not the purpose of the temple. Amen. The purpose of the temple was so that they could place the Ark of the Covenant there and do everything God wanted them to do, and sprinkle that blood, and man, they would meet with God in that temple. Praise the Lord. Amen. He knew that was important. And so he made it a priority. I guess the question tonight is this. Do we? Good. Is the presence of God, being in his presence, important to you? Is it important for you and me to meet with him? Amen. You know, one of the things, we, we had... I guess the last year and a half, particularly from last March on, we had lost a lot of time to do things. Right. I mean, we were stuck in a house for a little bit. I wonder how many of us took that time to emphasize our walk with God, to spend more time in the Bible, to spend more time reading His Word. You see, what is critical in the life of the believer today what is critical in the health of this church Amen. is not just for this preacher, and it's important for me to do, no doubt, but all of us Amen. to make our walk with God and the desire to be in his presence a priority. Amen. We must spend time with him. We must enter into his presence. I wonder sometimes if we, if we realize how much we need him. and how much. You see, everything in our life, everything, Amen. what we do for God, what we do in our workplace, uh, the kind of husband we are, the kind of wife we are, the kind of student that we are, the kind of employee we are, all of it flows, the victory we have in the Christian life, all of it flows from our walk with God and desire to be in his Amen. presence. But I wonder sometimes if we realize how much we need him. You know, we spend so much time on things like Facebook, social media, watching YouTube videos, playing video games, not, not, not that these are necessarily wrong, but I'm just saying how we spend our time. Uh, uh, some playing sports, uh, working out. Oh, I need to do that a little more. But anyway, doing that. And then we claim this. I don't have time to read my Bible. Hogwash. Amen. We have time for things we make time for. Right. Amen. And we make time for things that we, have, that we make a priority. Turn over to John chapter 15. We're going to end it here. John chapter 15. Perhaps one of, my, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. Because it reminds me, it reminds me that I need him. Amen. John 15, verse 1. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Notice, abide in me and I in you. That's the, that's the Ark of the Covenant right there. Amen. Uh, as the branch cannot bear fruit of, it, uh, of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. Uh, he that abideth in me, and I in him the same, bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. All of us want to bear fruit. Praise the Lord. We want our lives to be profitable for God. Amen. We want to reach souls. We want to make a difference in our families. Praise well, there's one requirement. Amen. Make the Ark of the Covenant a priority. Amen. Make your walk with Him a priority. Desire to be in His presence. Make it a priority. Amen. So often we make it an add-on. Right. 
Again, I say the Ark of the Covenant was not brought in last because it was the least important. It was brought in last because it was the most important. Amen. Solomon knew this whole thing's in vain right. if we're not going to meet with God. Amen. And can I say this? What we're doing is in vain. We can, we can be like right. one that beateth, right? Beat, a boxer that beateth the air, a person that, that, that tries to chop wood with a dull axe. We can waste all of our energies trying to do something for God and be something for God, but it will all be in vain if we don't make our walk with God a priority. Amen. I wonder sometimes if I would ask this question. Do you read your Bible every day? Every day? Pray every day. Amen. I used to, I used to think before I passed. I used to think, well, yeah. I mean, yeah, everybody does that. <laughs> they don't. They don't. And we wonder why we're so weak. Right. And we wonder Amen. why we're having so many problems. Lord it all God. goes back to the priority. Amen. Desiring to be in the presence of God. Amen. Would you and me tonight continue to or make that? the number one priority in Amen. your life above everything else you do, the very first thing ought to be our walk with Amen. God. Amen? Let's pray.